When it comes to the topic in this video, we should be, as Janus, ever looking at the past to see the future. As in the uh, idea of Janus having two faces, one looking at the past and one at the future. So let's go ahead and look at the Waco, Texas Bandito shooting, which allegedly took place on May 17th, 2015. According to Wikipedia, it states that on May 17, 2015, in Waco, Texas, the United States, she got erupted at Twin Peaks Restaurant, where more than 200 persons, including members from motorcycle clubs that include the Banditos, Cossacks, and Allies, had gathered for a meeting about political rights for motorcyclists. It's interesting, the vagary that is reported there. And this clearly bears a correlation to a city ordinance which was done first of all unconstitutionally but second has a similar date despite being allegedly passed later on there is a correlation between possible motive as in the conflict was essentially staged or it was done on on purpose there's somebody who was setting it up or some buddies plural according to this it's ordinance number 2015 there's the year 446 adored ordinance of the city of waco texas repealing and replacing in its entirety article 4 smoking regulations in chapter 16 nuisances of the code of ordinances of the city of waco in order to provide regulations prohibiting smoking of tobacco products and electronic smoking materials in certain enclosed and non-enclosed areas within the city limits. Notice that, non-enclosed areas. Prohibiting smoking on city premises and other property. Repealing all ordinances or parts of ordinances in conflict herewith. Providing a savings clause. Providing a severability clause. Providing for inclusion in the code. Providing for a penalty and finding. And determining at the meeting at which... This ordinance is passed as open to public as required by law. Whereas the City Council of the City of Waco finds that smoking tobacco products create nuisances, poses health risks, it causes fires. And notice the clear declaration there. The City Council of the City of Waco believes themselves dictators in the position to make findings on behalf. Well, it doesn't even state on the behalf. It just states that they find. Kind of like they're, they're judges. This document appears extremely similar to documents that I've previously covered about the so-called Faculty Senate of the University of Nebraska. And I would not be surprised if many of these city councilors are also part of uh, university faculty senates and uh, involved in other such roles where you have this essentially club of a few people dictating everything everywhere, essentially. Whereas the U.S. Surgeon General's report has stated that there's no safe level of, yeah, blah, blah, blah. I'm not going to read all of these whereases, which are just nonsense. And then we get into definitions. And all of the essential preamble, the annoying parts. So let's go ahead and look deeper into this under smoking prohibited areas. Smoking is hereby prohibited in all enclosed public places. These people sound like they're giving a royal decree. Smoking is hereby prohibited in the following non-enclosed public places, parks, and playgrounds as defined in this article and at public events held on property owned or occupied by the city and used for city purposes. Smoking is prohibited in all enclosed areas that are owned or occupied by the city and used for city purposes, including but not limited to buildings and vehicles. In addition, the city manager may designate any non-enclosed areas owned or occupied by the city or used by the city purposes as non-smoking. Notwithstanding any other provision of this section, any owner, operator, manager, or other person who controls any establishment facility. Now, here's the part. Notwithstanding any other provision of this section, any owner, 
operator, manager, or other person who controls any establishment, facility, or business may declare a portion of that entire establishment, facility, or business, including any non-enclosed areas as non-smoking. Now notice the very tricky wording they've put in there. They state a portion of or that entire establishment. Right. And of course it's other person. Notice the vague wording there. Except as provided in subsection this is smoking prohibited in places of employment. Except as provided in subsection 16-124 exceptions, an employer who shall provide a smoke free workplace for all employees, employees are not required to incur any expense to make structural or other physical modifications to create smoking areas. Prior to the effective date of this article, each employer who has an enclosed place of employment located within the city shall make known to all employees that smoking shall be prohibited in all enclosed areas within the place of employment, as those terms are defined in this article. Now, also remember, this is not just talking about smoking cigarettes. It's also talking about, quote, electronic devices. Again, more vague terms. Smoking is hereby prohibited at any place within 15 feet of any entrances, windows, ventilation systems, or any other openings of an enclosed area where smoking is prohibited. Now imagine that reasonable distance clause they, they put in there. And imagine you have a police officer coming up to a group of, of motorcyclists, telling them to stop smoking within an outdoor area, especially if it's been approved by the owner of the establishment because it's, quote, not within 15 feet of an entrance, or it is within 15 feet of an entrance. Well, the bikers would tell the go cops to go pound sand, and considering police officers, just like these people, do dislike having their, quote, unquote, authority questioned, then you have a shootout. Very easy. It's very simple. And also, you have lots of veterans in these motorcycle clubs and the smoke pit in the Military is the primary place for passing information through uh, less than official channels so that people really know what's going on despite the desires of the command for people to really know what's going on because when the command's doing something, you get like admin people that go out there and smoke and then they'll talk to everybody else and then you know exactly what's going to happen before it happens. And so naturally, people that know that would specifically target the veterans and their smoking habits. Exceptions. Notwithstanding any other provision of this article, to the contrary, the following areas shall be exempt from section 16, blah, 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 and shall constitute an affirmative defense of prosecution for violation of such section. Private residences, uh, except for residencies used as daycare, adult daycare, uh, or healthcare facility, retail tobacco stores, and retail electronic smoking device stores for sampling of the products sold in such stores, as long as such smoking does not cause smoke or vapor to cross into areas outside the store where smoking is not allowed. Cigar lounges, hookah bars, and hookah lounges, as defined herein, that were in business operating within the city of limits of the city as the date of adoption of this ordinance, met as of the date of adoption of this ordinance, and continuously meet the applicable definitions herein. And do not expand in size or change locations after the date of adoption of this ordinance, but only for consumption on the premises of shisha or cigars sold by the business. Any such establishment that ceases to operate as such for longer than 30 consecutive days or ceases to meet the definition of the same type of establishment at any time after the adoption of blah, blah, blah. Those outdoor areas within 15 feet of a door. That is not the main public ingress slash egress of the establishment and that leads only from a designated outdoor smoking area of the establishment to an area where smoking is prohibited. The door must remain closed except when someone is entering or exiting the area, so on and so forth. And then if you imagine you got a group of bikers that are outside of the front entrance around their bikes smoking, well, they are within 15 feet of a front door. Now we get into the very obvious evidence that this is a targeted approach to the motorcycle club uh, uniting at the Twin Peaks in Waco. No duty or obligation. In undertaking the enforcement of this article, the city is assuming an undertaking only to promote the general health, safety, and welfare of its citizens. Yeah, sure. The city is not assuming any... Do those are, of course, the juridic citizens. <laughs> Just uh, 
Got to mention that one. Not the human ones, the druidic ones. The city is not assuming any duty or obligation, nor is it imposing any duty and or obligation on its officers and or employees, nor is it liable in money damages or otherwise to any person who claims the city and or one of its officers and or employees breached any such obligation and a breach approximately caused injury. Notice that. They like to basically make declarations that they're not liable for any of the actions that they take. I love it when they do that in these stupid contracts. This is a contract, mind you. It's just not one. It's a one-sided contract where they sign it and uh, and declare that nobody else needs to be uh, aware of it, basically. Although it does state that it needs to be uh, put towards the public according to law. Now, in the the way that the manner they usually do that is in a very mischievous way, where the public humans can't access it, but the juridic entities can. So, more word games there. Shall be unlawful for any person who owns, manages, operates, or otherwise controls the use of any premises subject to regulation under this article to fail to comply with any of its provisions. It shall be unlawful for any person to smoke in any area where smoking is prohibited by the provisions of this article. Any person who violates any provision of this article shall be subject to the penalty for violating this ordinance as provided for in Section 1-14 of the Code of Ordinances of the City, which shall be a minimum fine of no less than $50, no more than a maximum fine of 500 as follows. Severability clause. The terms and provisions of this ordinance shall be deemed to be severable, and that if any section slash sub or subsection sentence clause or phrase of this ordinance shall be declared to be invalid or unconstitutional. Notice that. Shall be declared to be invalid or unconstitutional. Well, who's doing the declaring? Right? That would probably be them, because that's how they operate usually. Only they can declare it invalid or unconstitutional. The same shall not affect the validity of any other section, subsection, sentence, clause, or phrase of this ordinance, and the remainder of such ordinance shall continue in full force and effect, the same as if such invalid or unconstitutional provision had never been a part hereof. <sighs> what a crock. Trying to cover their butts, basically, from what they're doing. And nothing in this ordinance shall be construed to affect any suit or proceeding pending in any court or any rights acquired or liability incurred or any cause or causes of such action acquired or existing under act or prior ordinance. Blah, blah, blah. The usual. Let's go ahead and look at who enforces it. Well, I forgot to include the enforcement clause, but either way, you can look up this ordinance and as you can imagine the usual culprits are enforcing it and considering the effects of the shootout in Waco we know that police officer shows up questions a motorcycle rider and naturally everything escalates and so on and so forth the usual now Waco stands right between Austin and Dallas Fort Worth uh, along the interstate 35 and then their development map, of which there was road development around the time of the Waco incident, looks a lot like a uh, development map for a metro system, being that the road is uh, surprisingly straight versus a uh, land go uh, uh, a road that goes over the surface of the land and is restricted to the uh, ebb and flow of the terrain. If we're gonna use a water related wording there like ebb and flow of a river so on and so forth but anyway if it's an underground metro they usually appear straight and this particular topic i've covered before but in the current circumstances we find a similar thing playing out around um the banditos group in texas again and killings that are going along the uh, parallel interstate, which instead of going through from Austin to Dallas-Fort Worth, it goes from Houston to Dallas-Fort Worth, and uh, similar things, so on and so forth. But when we look at these articles, notice the strange coding and patterns that develop, such as three killed, posted twice, in the same manner, from two different outlets. And then when we look at another page, we find the same three alleged instead of three killed, 
but with a three in the same spot. And we also have three dead in two separate shootings. Both of those three plus two equals five. And then on the next one, we have at least five motorcyclists shot in separate locations in Texas. And that's right below three dead in two separate. And three plus two equals five. So there's something weird going on here with the numbers being posted. Anyway, I did cover this particular subject around the banditos in Texas and some other uh, interesting developments that correlate in the paving over the bodies of the banditos video they did. But let's go ahead and move on and look at other places and events that uh, hold a pattern to them and appear to correlate to this same theme and concept. So starting out, let's go to Cambridge, Ohio, which if we look at a map, it is in the direct pathway of the cross that is made by Interstate 77 and Interstate 70. Interstate 70 going east and Interstate 77 going south from Akron, east from Columbus on Interstate 70. And then Interstate 70 leads to Pittsburgh. And Cambridge is right in the center of three major hubs of traffic and in cambridge despite being small we have correlating shootings from recent times this year specifically we have one april 6 2023 illyria shooting leaves one injured uh, illyria police are seeking the public's help as they investigate in early wow that's uh Ilri, that's just Typo. April 6th shooting on Cambridge Avenue. Okay, that I don't believe that's Cambridge, Ohio. That's Delirium. Lieutenant Jerry E. Dragosin, Cambridge Police Department, Ohio. He was shot and killed in the driveway of the police department, allegedly. March 10th, 2023. Authorities have not released the names of the officers involved. The Cambridge Police Department is investigating a Sunday shooting. And then March... 8th, 2023, according to Cambridge Police Department statement, the gunfire detection system indicated multiple shots were fired. Dorchester. Then we have Cambridge, Pol Cambridge Police investigate shooting of Steubenville Avenue. Officers were dispatched shortly after 6 p.m. to the emergency room at Southeast Ohio Regional Medical Center in response to gunshot wound to the head. Cambridge resident shot after argument outside downtown business. April 7, 2023, woman injured in Cambridge Avenue shooting. Andrew Lippian, uh, first ward, posted on social media about shooting just after midnight Thursday morning. Now, when we go to a different part of Ohio, Mansfield, we find this particular location right in between with similar relation to location as Waco and Huntsville, Texas, where it is right between two major hubs, Columbus and Cleveland in Ohio, off of Interstate 77. So let's go ahead and look at activity here in Mansfield. We have, again, notice the weird numbers here. One dead, two injured, repeated twice, two different outlets, following shooting a drive through in Mansfield. Then we have and, of course, that's March 3rd, 2023. And then we also have March 3rd, 2023, 26-year-old. Notice the, the number where it's being placed. And then you have 26-year-old with two dashes between year and old and 26. Shot dead at Mansfield Convenience Store. And that's a drive-through. So there's a lot of patterns that are unfolding when we look at these things in correlation to other things happening around the nation. And we have two people shot at Spayer Lane residence, March 7th, 2023. Victim identified with fatal shooting at MS drive through March 3rd, 2023. And then March 10th, 2023, we have Mansfield. Police continue to search for a man who killed a 26-year-old father at Point Blank Ranch. And so, although that probably was an event that happened beforehand. No, that is the drive through one. And then we have, uh, of course, correlating construction projects happening around these highways. We have Warren County I-71 Mason Montgomery Road Project. Eagle Bridge Company was awarded a contract. And then we have ODOT I-71. That's Ohio Department of Transportation. 
Interchange Columbus Crossroads. Ohio I-70, I-71 Improvements East Trench Project. The I-70, I-71 Corridor. Now that's interesting, by the way. They, they do put the word corridor there, which is something I noticed when I was covering the stuff about uh, Texas. When they talk about these corridors, and usually a corridor is often like a corrido in Spanish. is referred to as a place where illicit activities are conducted and uh, basically a, a major route of transportation. It states phase three while currently under design, it is not scheduled to start construction until until beyond 2026. But then we have below that ODOT will spend nearly one billion on new 2023 construction work in central Ohio, widening Interstate 71 in Madison Pickaway counties and widening I-161 from I-270, it's Interstate 270, to US-62. Now notice that word widening. That is another pattern that we find repeated. And then October 2021 to summer 2023, bridge over I-70 will close in during summer 2022. So there it's basically talking about the duration and we are currently approaching summer of 2023 shelly and sands makes improvement to i-70 in ohio this is february 1st 2022 according to cindy riley shelly and sands serves as the general contractor for the project shelly and sands is a local contractor that's familiar with the city of zanesville and understands the importance of this project and the amount of traffic that uses this section of i-70 says said seals they have also constructed a large number of mega construction projects on the Ohio interstate systems around the state. Now, I guarantee you that Shelly and Sands is probably just a local shell contractor, meaning they're a subsidiary of some international conglomerate that usually seems to be the case. Anyway, let's look further at this. Large number of mega construction projects is a... Uh, uh, interstate says around the state. Yeah, according to ODOT project manager Michelle Sidwell, the main... That's Ohio Department of Transportation. Main concern for crews has involved a lack of right-of-way, resulting in narrow lanes and shoulders, creating a tight work zone for the public to travel and limiting access to work zones for the contractor. Now, I'm not sure which public they're talking about. They never really specify because a lot of these people know that there's two parallel publics. There's a dritic public and there's a human public, and they always like to keep their wording vague. So we never really know what they're talking about because we think we know what they're talking about, but they could be talking about something else. Another challenge has been determining the sequential construction of the ramps along with construction of the main line with elevation changes of the new pavement in each phase to ensure traffic has access in and out of Zanesville. Adequately maintaining the work zone and maintenance of traffic throughout the project due to the poor condition of the existing pavement and limited space in the work zone is another challenge. Yeah, I wonder why the it's in poor condition. Perhaps it was set up to be in poor condition in the first place. Work began in July 2021 with the current completion date of October 2027. The project is currently in phase one and is working to remove the existing medium barrier and demolition on various bridges, which include superstructure and substructure removal. Sub meaning below said Sidwell, who added that the reconstruction I-70 through the city of Zanesville is no small undertaking. Blah, blah, blah. In order to get to the point of construction, our planning and design team has spent several years working on the project District 5 along with our consultants. Worked hard to survey, plan, get through the environmental process, design, move utilities, and coordinate right-of-way needs. Yeah, well, why would they need to be working through all that stuff if they're the ones that control it in the first place? This has been a substantial effort, which has also required a good amount of help and collaboration with the city of Zanesville. Yeah, sure. All just a bunch of corrupt friends working together. Former liner and straining the parapets and MSE walls and vandal fence with lettering to enhance the overall end product. The bridges were constructed when the interstate was originally built and have had various rehabilitation projects completed throughout the years, but have deteriorated to a point where a major rehabilitation effort was needed. 
Time and cost of maintenance on these bridges was becoming excessive. Furthermore, design standards also have changed since these bridges were originally constructed. And blah, blah, blah. It's just talking about the, the bridge. And here we get a similar theme to what I was talking about in the video about the uh, developments in Texas, where you have the removal of existing pavement, cement stabilization of the subgrade, and placement of the 304 aggregate base and asphalt for all the main line on phases 1, 2, and 3. And the off ramps. And it states the real rehabilita rehabilitation on the Zanesville State Street Signature Bridge, which will occur in the summer of 2022 while school is not in session, will be the first major milestone for crews in addition reconstruction of each ramp and reopening them to traffic at the State Street Interchange will be a turning point in construction. Other major milestones will be the completion of each phase of construction, said Sidwell. However, the most significant to the residents of Zanesville and surrounding areas is the completion of Phase 3, which will allow all ramps to be reopened to traffic, including the 6th Street westbound on-ramp and Maple Avenue eastbound on-ramp, which have been closed since switching to Phase 1 in the fall of 2021 due to safety concerns. Haven't heard that one before. Not to mention these phases sound uh, quite a lot like something that was repeated when it came to the phases of a certain substance that shall not be named for fear of YouTube censorship. Well, not for fear of, for certainty of, anyway. The, well, they'll censor anyway, so whatever, who cares. The I-70 eastbound ramp to SR-315 northbound closed permanently March 20th, 2022. Notice that interesting part there. Closed permanently. Then October 2021 to summer 2023, the State Street Bridge over I-70 will close and during summer 2022. The ramp from 6th Street to I-70 West will close in October for approximately 5.5 years. Very interesting there. ODOT will spend nearly $1 billion on new 2023 construction work in Central Ohio, widening Interstate 71 in Madison and Pickaway counties, improving I-270 and I-70 interchanges to Columbus and widening. There we go with the widening thing. And road construction closes I-70 westbound to SR-315 northbound in downtown Columbus 315. Next phase of the downtown mega fix enters a new stage this weekend. That's March 24, 2023. And the first one is March 15th. Now the company selected for this, Cocosi, makes strides on $1.3 billion downtown ramp up in Columbus. How Department of Transportation's ODOT $1.3 billion I-70 I-71 downtown ramp up project in the city of Columbus, Franklin County. Next, we have Jurgensen Company was awarded a contract for more than $48 million to undertake the project, and construction is anticipated to be completed in spring 2022. That's for Interstate 70 widening project. So this company, Jurgensen Companies LLC, when you look into their business filings, they are made by GFH Entity Services, Inc. And there you've got the information that was signed on that. Now, as usual, when you look up GFH Entity Services or anything with GFH, we get a good number of companies, and it as always represents a maze of shell corporations that bounce around. So let's go ahead and look at one of them. That would be the GFH Holdings, Inc., or Haas Holdings, Inc., H-A-A-S. And that allegedly is incorporated in Sturge or in Oxnard, California, off Sturgis Road. And then there is a Haas Holdings LTD in the United Kingdom. As always with these construction projects, once you start digging through all of the company filings, you usually find that it will come about that. 
we essentially have foreign companies working on all of our highways. And this company allegedly was dissolved in the 24th of March, 2020. I guess the uh, associating entities did not get the memo in the United States. And then, of course, in, in Texas, you have Ferro Vial, the Spanish company. Now, let's uh, go and look at some other places around the nation, such as Columbia, Missouri. Which is interesting, was spelled M-I-S-U-R-I in Google. Uh, I wonder if that's an accident. And then Columbia is off of another interstate, but it is right between two hubs again, San Luis and Kansas City. Those are two large city centers. Uh, of course, naturally, we have recent shootings. April 10th, two people were shot and taken to hospital with injuries that were non-life-threatening, a Columbia Police Department spokesman said. April 10th, 2023. April 11th, 2023, Royale Dwayne Hunt, 34, was arrested on suspicion of unlawful use of a weapon, unlawful possession of a firearm. And that's uh, according to shooting outside of a gas station, Columbia. Then we have March 16, 2023, active shooter incident. Uh, and then you have April 10, 2023, two shot near East Columbia, High V gas station. That's the one that we mentioned earlier. Let's look at the companies for Missouri. Four company team named as contractors for Missouri River Bridge. Team of companies from Wisconsin, Virginia, Tennessee, and Minnesota. That sounds like uh, the Shell Corporation game to me. Has been selected to design and build the new Interstate 70 bridge over the Missouri River near Rocheport. According to a news release from the Missouri Highways and Transportation Commission, the team will consist of Lunda Construction Company from Wisconsin, Parsons Transportation Group from Virginia. Notice that name, by the way. Parsons Transportation Group. These people are not very good at hiding their corruption. Dan Brown and Associates from Tennessee and Hugh Zhang United from Minnesota. It sounds like China. <laughs> and this, of course, is from a article. Current bridge built in 1960 is in poor condition. More than 12 million vehicles, including 3.6 million trucks, cross every year, according to MoDOT, Missouri Department of Transportation website. Design for the new construction includes two three-lane bridges, one westbound, one eastbound. They were cost an estimated $250 million, $40 million, and are expected to last for 100 years. It was funded in part by an $81.2 million infrastructure for rebuilding America grant, the largest competitive grant ever received by MoDOT. This announcement is the culmination of a lot of hard work and dedication by a large group of people dedicated to Missouri's transportation system and infrastructure. Yeah, I'm sure that's the underground transportation infrastructure. Not the one for the human public, but the one for the juridic public. Notice this one. That name right there. Parson wants to widen I-70 near Kansas City. Will it help congestion? Missouri Governor Mark Pars Mike Parson proposed spending $859 million to widen I-76 lanes near Kansas City, Columbia, and St. Louis. And then you've got this Missouri River Bridge that's involved in the nonsense. MoDOT displays new plan for St. Charles County, I-70, I-64 interchange. Lawmaker wants to use Missouri surplus to widen... There we go again with that word, widen I-70 in Missouri. And then you've got Missouri Governor Mark, Mike Parsons. Again, that name, Parsons. And let's look at the dates now. I-70 slash 44, St. Louis City, express lanes. The ramp from the express lanes to Broadway are closed through early summer 2023. Many different patterns here. Now let's go up to Michigan. Monroe, Michigan is right between Detroit and Toledo off of Interstate 75. Again, it's a similar location as the other ones that I've covered. 
Again, you have this th number three put in the front. Three arrested in Monroe, Michigan, Werman's murder. April 8, 2023, Kayla Sadowski, 23, was found dead in the floor inside an abandoned detention center in March. Monroe Police Department 2, beginning with letter 2, number 2, by the way. Members of Monroe County bank robbery crew arrested after 15th heist in 5th state. 50 mile chase, blah, blah, blah. March 13th, 2023, 18-year-old suspect from Monroe arrest and charged with assault. And then we have March 9th, 2023, according to police, 18-year-old Julia Rose Hatenga was shot a male at his home in the 100 block of Birchwood Trail around 2 p.m. And then we have MSCO, this is February 14th, 2023, around five victims, one dead after shooting in Monroe County Co. Monroe Co. I believe that. Yeah, that's Monroe County. Several agencies said they were helping respond to reports of a shooting in Monroe County on Thursday. Man arrested after allegedly shooting wife in Monroe, Michigan. That's June 8th, 2023. So, there we go. Then, June 15th, 2020, state trooper involved in Monroe County shooting. This is a very interesting article here. The incident happened, happened shortly before 4.30 p.m. Monday as of 6.11 p.m. Police are investigating a trooper involved shooting that happened shortly before. 4.30 p.m. Monday in the area of South Dixie Highway and Dunbar Road. The Michigan State Police reported via Twitter that the 2nd District Special Investigation Section was sent to Monroe County for trooper-involved shooting. Preliminary information is the trooper was dispatched to a suspicious white male walking in the street with a knife yelling at cars. When detec detectives arrived... We will update this incident with current information. Medical condition of the suspect is unknown. It's kind of interesting. Seems very suspicious. Nearly a dozen marked vehicles from Michigan State Police and Monroe County Sheriff's Office were in southbound lanes of South Dixie in the area in front of Muggsy's and Gruel Buick GMC for over an hour. Both southbound lanes were blocked in that area. Northbound traffic was allowed to continue. That seems a little odd for just one person running around with a knife yelling at cars, doesn't it? Little odd. And then naturally we have I-75 projects going on. February 21st, 2023. 27 southbound I-75 exits at 12 mile road, 11 mile road, and eastbound and westbound I-696 will be closed for construction season. It's the Michigan government, which is a corporation, of course. 2023 construction on I-75 between I-696 and 13 mile road has been underway since late February, with motorists utilizing two lanes in each direction. Set of seven projects to reconstruct, widen, and improve I-75. Blah, blah, blah. Goes through Ohio. Here we'll look at the article from January 28, 2019. Detroit area I-75 to see $799 million of construction through 2023, part of $1.6 billion modernization. By Kim Slowey, contributing editor for the Construction Dive. Detroit area Oakland County, Michigan, will see $799 million of construction during the next five years as part of the $1.6 billion segments 2 and 3 of the Michigan DOTS I-75 modernization project, the Oakland Press reported. So they're calling them segments instead of phases. The MDOT awarded the $224 million design-build contract for Segment 2 of the project to the joint venture of Walsh Construction Company and Tuebe Construction LLC in July 2018. Walsh Twebby will install 8 miles of pavement, replace 18 structures, upgrade drainage. Got a lot of similar things going on here. It's, it's just, it's almost like the same. They're all doing the same type of work on the same 
types of places in the same types of locations with the same types of activities happening around them at the same time. It's very interesting. Upgrade drainage, install noise walls, and build a portion of the entire modernization project's high occupancy vehicle HOV lanes. The Oakland Corridor Partners won the $1.4 billion contract to design, build, finance, and maintain Segment 3. Yeah, one. I'm sure there was a legitimate competition for that. <laughs> Please. The group will rebuild more than five miles of pavement, modernize the highway. Probably talk about the underground structure there. Rehab 28 bridges and make safety upgrades. Construction alone is estimated at $629 million, according to the project's revenue bond underwriters. Segment 1 was completed at a cost of $90 million. The MDOT's original plan was to award as many as five separate contracts for the 18-mile I-75 modernization decision to divide the project into three pieces and hand over Segment 3 to Oakland Corridor Partners. John Laying Investment LTD, ACOM Capital Inc., JD Contractors Inc., Ajax Paving Industries Inc., and Dan's Excavating Inc. will shorten the construction schedule by approximately 10 years. Now, of course, all of this stuff is smoke and mirrors to make it look like you have multiple entities involved, when in fact, they always seem to go back to the same one, and they're all just subsidiaries and shell corporations and whatnot. The state said it is also benefiting from including maintenance in the Segment 3 deal and agreements that transfer maintenance responsibilities to a private party said former state transportation director Kirk Strudel, public owner benefits from guaranteed performance standards and long-term pricing that is locked in throughout the agreement. Notice that the public owner, that's a juridic public owner. Not the human public owner. More state dots are embracing the public-private partnership, P3 method, that would be interesting to look into. The public-private partnership. That all has to do with juridic entities. Juridic public and juridic private. Method to get their transportation projects done more efficiently and pass on all or a portion of the financing headaches. The Ohio DOT, for instance, completed its first P3 in December. Yes, of course, uh, all of their financing is coming from... Well, we know where it's coming from. It's all just appropriations, misappropriated funds all this other stuff well in what some ways it's misappropriated but to them it wouldn't be misappropriation because they're all just agents of the dritic public and the human public is the property of the dritic anyway the 16 mile that's how they see it 16 mile 634 million portsmouth bypass or ohio 823 is now open to motorists and like the mdots i-75 modernization was originally supposed to be split into multiple phases, the ODOT said if the department had issued separate contracts, only the first of three would be finished by now instead of the entire project. Portsmouth Gateway Group, which includes ACS Infrastructure, Infrared Capital Partners, LTD, and Star America will also maintain the four-lane highway for 35 years. Again, I expect all of those companies go back to the same original source. So this game is always played... Construction costs were $400 million, and contractors in the project included Dragados USA, Beaver Excavating Company, and the John R. Jurgensen Company. Very interesting. They list that as John R. Jurgensen. And then you have the Jurgensen filing, which goes back to the UK. And this is in similar relation to what I had covered previously, but for the sake of this video, I'll go over it again, where there was a Gainesville, Virginia shooting that was with Ferro Vial Company and their expansion project of the interstate that goes through Gainesville, Virginia. And in March, May 13th, 2022, and September 26th, 2022, which is around the time that that construction project was allegedly completed, you had two specs, suspects wanted a connection to a fatal shooting. You had two charged with murder and Gainesville fatal shooting. Notice that word two is placed first, just as with all the other ones. And then you also have Moy man pointing gun at passing tourists in Gainesville being shot by an, quote, off-duty police officer, federal officer, 
which sounds quite similar to the guy running around with a knife yelling at motorists. Scam. Now, there's a couple reasons why they would want to set this up, and it's not just because they can close off the highways, which they've already closed off to the human public for construction purposes anyway, and it's not just because they can post guards either, but in fact, they can also use the first responder vehicles to smuggle equipment and and individuals and other people such as through ambulances or fire trucks or basically all the large first responder vehicles they can smuggle equipment and people in without anyone in the human public asking questions so they can clandestinely do basically whatever they want and nobody can stop them because they control the system thank you if you have enjoyed this content please check out my other videos especially on this particular subject please share this video like it subscribe to my channels and check out my other content there are free books available at the link and if you so desire you may also support my work at paypal or cash app thank you